Um, so I'm Sumner Norman. Uh, I've been a research scientist at Caltech for the past five years. Uh, I've also been the chief neuroscientist at a data science and software development firm called AE Studio, based in Los Angeles. And although not public yet, I am the founder of a research organization that's spinning up called Forest Neurotechnology. So I wear a few different hats. I'm not really sure which hat I'm wearing in this, this talk. This is just my personal opinions, basically all put into one long slide deck. So please feel free to ask me about any of those particular aspects. But um, looks like our TV's working, so I'll just jump in. Um, since I'm the first talk of the day, I thought I would just very quickly say what a brain-computer interface is at its kind of most core concept. It's pretty simple. You need something to record the biophysics of your brain activity in the first place. That's then sent out, usually to a computer, but it doesn't really matter what it is, that needs to decode or interpret that brain function into some intended activity or a command. These days, that's typically neuroprosthetic devices, so these are going to be controlling computer cursors for people that are paralyzed or robotic arms, like you'll see in a moment. But then you can also close the loop, so now you're seeing the result of that, and you have this kind of closed loop that forms, or you can just directly go the other way and take a command, send it through an encoder, and then actually stimulate areas of the brain to create percepts. So that is basically it. I'm gonna give you the answer to this talk. This talk is really about what the next generation of BCIs are, and uh, it's really actually pretty straightforward. This is where we're at today. We're addressing paralysis. The vast majority of BCIs that are under development now, both in academia and industry, as you'll see, are geared towards people with chronic paralysis that's due to a neurological condition or injury. But this is where we're headed, and you notice there's an overlap, and these are the actual number of people with drug-resistant forms of severe versions of these things. So about a million people in the US have paralysis, but about 21 million people have these more widespread brain circuit disorders. So treatment or resistant forms of depression, anxiety, pain, OCD, but really depression, anxiety, and pain make up, I think, 18 or 19 of those 21 million. Um, once we have that, though, I think that this is actually a gateway. So I'm going to talk a lot about this. How do we get to the next step? But really, I think what this, the Foresight Institute cares about is this. What happens when you cure very serious forms of depression, but now anyone can effectively start twisting the knobs on their affect or what they care about or kind of the, like the best version of themselves and what they can be. But you first have to solve that middle problem. Um, to zoom out a little bit, I find it's really helpful to think about the future of a technology by starting out with, this, with its history. So going back all the way to Luigi Galvani in 1780, let me see if I can hide this really quick though, because um, it's a little bit in the way. Hide floating meeting controls. There we go. Okay. So going all the way back to 1780, Luigi Galvani discovered that if you stimulated with electricity a dead frog's legs, it would twitch. We take this for granted today that our, that our bodies use electricity to communicate, but it was fairly new at the time. Um, jumping to 1924, Hans Berger recorded the first brain waves using electroencephalography. So now we know that human brain activity is electrical and measurable. But I think that this is actually one of the coolest demos that I really love showing. So this was Jose Delgado in 1963, quite the showman. Um, what you'll notice here is that in, if you look closely in his, I think, left hand, he's holding a radio transceiver, and there's a button on there. And when he presses the button, there's a deep brain stimulator inside that bull's head, and he presses the button, and it basically stops the bull's charging activity. It's extremely crude in the terms of neurotechnology because you're basically just zapping the hell out of the brain and, the, and activity changes, big surprise, or behavior changes. But um, it's, it's pretty enlightening. Um, let's jump forward. Okay, so now we're actually getting to real closed-loop BCI. In 1969, Eb Fetz, uh, at the time as a postdoc at the University of Washington, actually taught a monkey to control the firing activity of a single neuron. And so this monkey could literally ramp up firing, ramp it right back down in closed loop, and then as a result, get a juice reward. So this was the first time we knew that closed loop BCI was possible. Jumping forward a little bit in the 90s, if you look closely here, is the video moving in? Okay, you see the monkey here. There's a, his head, there's his hand, and he has these plugs coming out of his head. Now this is early days of neurotech, so they kind of hide the fact this is pretty gruesome. But, um, here that we're recording ensemble activity, no longer a single neuron, but hundreds of them. And with hundreds of neurons, some of them are tuned or otherwise fire when the monkey intends to move to the right, some to the left. And once you start to put those together with machine learning, you can get fine control over robotic arms. You can see here the monkey's reaching out 
with this robotic arm to grab this kind of black puck on another robotic arm. And when he does that correctly, he gets a sip out of his little juice reward here. Um, so going from the 90s to 2006, the first in human, here's a human playing Pong. I'm going to come back to that in a minute. Um, you may guess why. But this was Lee Hochberg's group in the BrainGate trial that is still ongoing today and the biggest uh, group of BCI participants. 36 patients now have been implanted with Utah rays like this, five of them at Caltech. Um, so they're still fairly scarce, but these are very special participants. You can see the kind of plugs headed out of their head. All of these technologies are currently based on the Utah Ray or Neuroport. So I'm showing it here, sitting on the head of a US penny, 100 channels per electrode array. These are going to record, each array is going to pick up on the order of like 50 to 200 neurons. You can use a single tip to detect single neurons, or sometimes they don't find any luck of the draw, and depends how long the array's been in. Um, so to give you a sense of what we've been doing at Caltech, the robotic arms are back, but now this is Eric. He's one of our patients. He's the first patient we implanted. My colleague Tyson Aplala, you can see the pedestal is coming out of Eric's head. We asked him what he wanted to do with his BCI, and he said, you know, being paralyzed, uh, I live with my mom, and she gives me a hard time every weekend when I want to have a beer, and she'll give me the first one without giving me too much guff, but on the second one, she always gives me a hard time, and like, man, if I could just have a beer without someone giving me, <laughs> giving me shit about it, it'd be great. And so you see the elation on his face. That's him drinking a beer without anyone complaining. Um, I, I feel in there. Um, this is more recent. This is one of our newer participants. He really loved playing first-person shooter video games before he was in a car accident that paralyzed him from the neck down. Um, and the reason I like to show this video is because if I hadn't told you ahead of time that he was paralyzed, I think you'd have a hard time discerning that he was. So BCIs really are getting to this point where their communication rates within narrow motor type tasks are actually approaching uh, what we can do. And more recent work, I'm not going to show it just for time purposes, but more recent work we've done at AE Studio is actually using handwriting, imagined handwriting. And we can actually imagine handwriting every bit as fast as we can literally handwrite. Um, so pretty cool. So OK, next generation BCIs implies that there's a first generation of BCIs. So I'm drawing the bar here as first generation BCIs. Uh, many of you MC, I'm sure have seen the Neuralink uh, demo of a monkey playing Pong. Everyone freaked out about this and said, this is amazing. I can't believe somebody's playing Pong or a monkey's playing Pong with its brain. But as you saw a minute ago, we've been doing that since 2006. What's different is that this monkey's implant has no big cable coming out, no server rack sitting behind him. All of that technology has been miniaturized into a commercializable package that looks like this. It's entirely inside the skull. It's wireless, both for charging and data transfer. So the technological leap is immense, and that is what Neuralink actually is doing. Um, they're not the only ones. Uh, they get a lot of attention because Elon, but um, there's another company called Paradromics and several others, but just to highlight one, they're going from 3,000 channels in the Neuralink array. Paradromics is aiming at 30,000. So um, I don't think that Neuralink is particularly special there, but they are very good at PR. Um, so where do these fall short, these first generation neurotechnologies? First and foremost, uh, let's see, longevity. Um, so the Neuroport, which is what we use in our participants, and the Neuralink, doesn't really matter which one you use, they don't last forever. So every five years, Eric has to be re-implanted, which is a pretty gruesome surgery. So re removing the skull, cutting open the dura, literally pneumatically shooting these electrodes into the brain, which causes damage. And then they slowly degrade over five years. So the best control you have is two weeks after your surgery, and then it's all downhill from there, which kind of sucks. Um, so that's a really, really big problem with electrodes. Another one is diminishing returns. Um, so this is uh, a particular task we did. I'm showing accuracy on the y-axis versus the number of uh, neurons that we're recording from on the x. And you can see that at some point, you kind of see this plateauing behavior. As the complexity of task ramps up, that's, uh, you can actually get a little bit more out of them. But it's to say that just because you have 30,000 channels, it's not necessarily 10 times better than 3,000 and so on, that it gets harder and harder as you scale up. But more than anything is really that, and I, you can tell it's a big problem because I put problem is really big, <laughs> is that neurotechnology needs to interact with the entire brain. So I'm showing here the distributed depression networks that we know of. So depression is really a catch-all term that's really referring to the symptoms, not the underlying phenotypes or biomarkers of depression. I'm showing a few here, but what I, I want you to notice 
is that these networks that we're identifying, even with fairly crude access to them, like from functional MRI, are distributed throughout the brain. So these circuit-wide systems um, are always changing. They are adaptable. They are something we can measure, but not with electrodes. So you saw in that last slide, the tiny little region in the brain that the, those electrodes can access cannot see these. Um, so that's talking about the kind of healthcare space. But as we think about BCIs, I want to point out the concepts span the entire brain. This is from a group at uh, UC Berkeley, Jack Gallon's group. And all these different colors kind of represent different aspects of our thinking. But I can just illustrate this very quickly. Many of you probably had a cup of coffee this morning. That cup of coffee is going to be familiar to you as you think about it right now. Maybe the touch, the sense of touch of the cup that you held. You can imagine the warmth of the coffee, the taste of the coffee, et cetera. That is brain-wide networks encoding a single semantic or a single thing, memory, that you experienced. And it's actually those brain-wide networks that encode the most interesting information. And we can't access them with electrodes. So generation two BCI key attributes is going from these small-scale electrode-based devices. I forgot to mention that the, the, the Neuralink, you would need six of them to cover just 1% of superficial cortex. That's to say nothing of the folds of your brain and nothing of deep brain structures where much of what kind of makes us us uh, lies. So large scale, the ability to record very large regions of the brain, um, ideally minimally invasive, that goes hand in hand with their ability to last for a very long time. Um, and there you go, long lasting. So what that enables is what is impossible today is that every neurotechnology is only really good at one particular application. So one of our participants asked us, you know, hey, uh, like many people who are paralyzed, I'm also depressed. And this kind of just sucks to be, you know, tetraplegic. Is there anything that neurotechnology can do for me there? As great as controlling this robotic arm is like, is there anything you can do for my depression? And the answer is yes. You need to enroll in another study that's a million dollars to implant a deep brain stimulator. It's investigational. It's going to be several surgeries to put it in. It's only going to last a few years, and it might treat your depression. Well, that kind of sucks. Um, so right now, we're in a state where every single technology approaches one thing. What we really want is many applications with a single device. So once you're able to sense those brain-wide circuits and systems for depression, there's no reason that you can't use the exact same device to look at circuits for sleep, um, for your anxiety, for neuropathic pain, um, or maybe you just want a kind of you know, better ability to pay attention or what have you, that's all at your fingertips. So I like to think of this as a little bit like a smartphone where second generation BCI can be reprogrammable, infinitely reprogrammable through software alone rather than reimplantation. The solution, one solution that I'm quite biased towards is my work in ultrasound. You can tell it's a big solution because it says big solution. Um, so just to give you a sense of this very quickly, this is kind of standard MRI, standard conventional ultrasound. These are the types of signals we're getting with functional ultrasound. I would love to discuss the physics of this with you, but offline. Um, and anyway, they're very beautiful images, but we also get these kind of very, very small changes in red, red blood cell motion that are very tightly coupled to the underlying neuro, uh, neural activity down to the kind of individual arterial beds and capillaries. So we're talking on the order of, we can sense about 100 neurons at a time, as opposed to functional MRI, which you need in the order of tens of millions of neurons that are doing coherent things to detect their activity. Um, Can you say it again? Uh, which part? The oh, yeah, yeah. So uh, we can detect, in the individual voxel of functional ultrasound, there's about 100 neurons. So if those 100 neurons are doing somewhat something similar, then we can detect that change. Uh, functional MRI is on the order of millions or tens of millions of neurons have to be acting coherently. Um, so the question was, this is large scale. It's minimally invasive. It's safe and effective. Ultrasound's been around for about 50 years. Uh, the question was if it would work as a BCI. So we recorded brain activity from rhesus macaques for the first time in about 2018. Um, while they conducted these different kind of video game-like tasks with their eyes and hands moving to different targets on the screens, um, and then tried to predict only from the functional data alone from their brain what their intended movement was, and then this is kind of their actual mo movement. This is called a confusion matrix, where if it's perfectly diagonal, then you're perfectly decoding. To summarize this, what this is telling us is that we can decode not only when the monkey was going to move, we could detect where he was going to move, and we could detect what part of his body he was going to move. 
before he ever actually did any of it. Um, so this is predictive behavior of his motor planning. So what's next? Um, I'm realizing I'm running up against time quite badly. Um, you can decode faces. So you can literally show someone in an MR scanner a bunch of faces and then from the brain activity alone, reconstruct them. So this is one of the really cool applications that's coming up in the BCI space. I mentioned earlier these brain-wide semantics that can literally reconstruct entire scenes. Um, therapeutics, so we can turn these things around and actually start stimulating ultrasound to write with precise focus. You can do drug delivery to very particular parts of the brain um, and modulate the neural activity directly by literally stretching and squeezing the neurons into firing with acoustic radiation torques. Um, this, I think, is a really cool, this is done with fMRI. Again, I think we can do this quite a lot better with ultrasound, so we're just getting started on this. But this was a clip that was presented to people in an MRI scanner. And then this is the clip that's reconstructed from brain activity alone. And so you can imagine a world where, and I'm not a great artist, if I wanted to convey to you an idea, a visual idea, it would take me weeks probably to get that down into paper. But here you can literally construct an idea directly into visual space to one another. So you can imagine the kind of transcription fluency human to human communication could actually approach. Um, there are a ton of other applications. I'm stealing this from my very good friend, Milan Svitkovich. I advise going to his uh, website and checking this out, or you can take a picture of it. But um, this is just the ideas that like he has come up with and I've helped him come up with. So I've mostly been talking about neurological diseases, which I'm crossing a few out there because we all already use Neurotech for those. These are the ones that we're working on right now. And then basically all of this is what we have to go. So if you're curious about the future of BCI, once you solve these, you start to get many of these for free. Um, and that is actually where I think the next generation of BCI leaves us. So I'm sorry for going over time, um, but I hope that that's been a fun introduction to BCI. We can. Thank you. Thank you. No question. Do you think it's possible to reverse engineer uh, like a high level of uh, fMRI or major fMRI to, uh, and get it back as a signal through the BMI? In other words, it's still a black box. You still don't yeah. understand what's going on. You get the, uh, the phenotype, phenotypical behavior, like mm -hmm. depression like this, or and you would be able to encode it back. Yeah. To, it's, it's usually not one-to-one, -one, that reversibility. Now, it, it's super domain-specific. So in electrodes, for example, actually we, at AE Studio, we just created the spiking data simulator, which is really fun. You can sit down at a computer, move your mouse around, and then we used terabytes of monkey data to train a model, whereas you move your mouse around, it actually recreates the predicted activity as if you had those Utah rays implanted. And you can stream that data in real time and feed it into a BCI decoder, and it will then re-decode, and you, your mouse movement, you can actually have a mouse movement like to go like this, and you see this thing following it around from your brain activity. So yes, in motor scenarios, absolutely, we've done it. In depression phenotypes um, and biomarkers, actually reversing those, that's a little less clear, although there's evidence from deep brain stimulator studies that once you actually smack those networks hard enough, you can kind of reset them. That's very crude. Um, doing it with like this kind of high fidelity, high manipulation approach is a, a more of an open question. I don't know. And a follow up, like uh, taking it one notch beyond, like generative AI. When you start synthesizing, <laughs> you know, you know, pictures and, and, and you know, graphical representation of phenotypical behaviors. Yeah. You know, either simulation or you know, play with, with living beings on this, of course. But uh, is it something you're thinking about? Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah, I. I like as you saw in that, just that clip of reconstructed brain activity. So that one is guided in the sense that you're showing someone a thing and then you're deconstructing or reconstructing it. But what the brain can actually generate directly is a totally open question. And there's very little work on that at this point. And a bottleneck of it is the technology to access those brain states, which is what we're trying to solve at Forest is to create these implantable versions of MRI, if you will. I think you were next. Um, I'm currently impressed with the work you've uh, presented on optically transparent skull flaps. Yeah. Um, and I'm really curious. So are these uh, lots of questions? One, do these stay permanently, or is it like a like a in between step? They're permanent. Wow. Permanent. Yep. Two. Um, have you thought about extending that to larger areas of the skull? Because I know cranial decompressions are super common where yes. people have accidents. Yep. So maybe there could be multiple people who would have such and need to compare and have different brain areas. And Absolutely. Also, what if you don't just remove the part of the skull which is you know 
on an injured section, what if you had a larger area, so you could use it for whole brain imaging? Yep. Have you like considered that? Yeah, I don't even think you actually need to replace the whole skull. So I mean, one of the cool things about these remote sensing techniques is that their field of view is programmable. Mm -hmm. So you can kind of shine light out, if you will, or, or yeah. ultrasound weights or whatever it is. So I don't know that you actually need the whole skull. And in fact, like the section that we took from him, that was for his injury, so it's huge. Mm -hmm. um, ideally, you could actually just have a few of these windows kind of peppered throughout the brain. I think with back of the napkin calculations, I think with six burr hole size uh, cranial windows, you could actually get like almost the entire brain. And third question, what if you put, have you considered putting electrodes into the replacement flap so that you could interface via this rather than needing to have electrodes going deep? So the brain could yes. organically build connections there? Okay. Yes, I have thought of that. <laughs> it's a good idea. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, maybe offline. Um, I, I think that once you actually start putting things into the skull flap itself, it really opens up a lot of possibilities because if you have an optically and acoustically clear way of actually creating implants, mm -hmm. uh, you can not only do remote sensing, but because you're touching the brain directly, you can have electrodes that are sitting right there, do multimodal interfacing. Um, and I mean, the world is your oyster. There's so much you can do with the brain. It's, it's genuinely a giant bottleneck at this point that we're stuck with electrodes. So once you move to these remote sensing things, I, yeah, I could go on for hours. So I think we just have time for one more question, unfortunately. I know there's a lot of questions in the room, but you will be around all, <laughs> yes, all day. Um, so who's got the last burning question? I don't know how I'm going to choose, but go for it. Okay. Well, I guess it's just one question. I was curious about the graph you showed up the diminishing returns in yeah. the past. Like, do, do you have any insights, insights into what, what is that happening? I mean, if you could record more brain activity, yep. would you get more performance? Or is it like a limitation of the human brain not being able to learn the task well enough? Or? Oh, it's absolutely a limitation of the scale of the recording. So when you're in small neural populations, you're recording from, elect or sorry, from neurons that are highly correlated. So neurons that are very close by in the brain tend to be doing the same thing. They are, are after all, very connected to one another. And so you're recording redundant information, basically. So even if you scale up to a thousand neurons, if they're still in the same small patch of brain, mm -hmm. a lot of those neurons are just doing the same thing. Um, and they're probably not. If you, that's what I was kind of mentioning about task complexity, that if you get enough tasks, then one neuron that like, let's say this neuron always fires when you move to the right, this one always fires when you move to the right. And maybe that's true, unless it's your foot that you're moving to the right. Maybe one is foot tuned and right tuned and the other one is hand tuned and right tuned. And so you can start differentiating task complexity. Um, but that becomes an increasingly difficult machine learning problem. Um, I actually think that's the more tractable problem. So there is still utility in scaling up electrodes, but that utility is limited by the spatial coverage. So I think if you could get them all over the brain, that'd be great. But you deal with all the damage and the delivery problems. So like, you can find the simpler tasks. Are you saying that high resolution recording of the smaller area will also help? Or is it uh, in simpler tasks, probably not. In simpler tasks, you, you probably don't need that much resolution. You would want more coverage to just do more tasks. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much, everybody. Yeah.